Hey guys, hope everybody's doing okay. What we're going to do today is take a look at something called concentration cells and corrosion of metals as we continue through our electrochemistry unit here. So a concentration cell, um, you know, based just off of the name here, is going to be some voltaic cell that um, the electron movement is going to depend on the difference in concentrations of our two half cells. So if we take a look at the first example I have here, um, both of my half cells, you'll notice, are the exact same. They're one molar for both of them. And they're both silver chloride solutions with a silver wire for both of them. So if I asked you what the EMF or the voltage of that cell, um, what do you think that would be? Well, hopefully you guessed that the EMF of this would be zero, because why would there be any electron movement at all, right? You have the same concentrations for both. You have the same metal for both. Um, if you compare the, like if you looked up the reduction potential of silver, um, and both of these are you know, silver anodes and cathodes, right? You would subtract the two values and you get zero. So the cells at standard conditions with one molar solutions, same chemicals being used in both. And if you, if you think about it, the, the Q for this, uh, because we're at one molar solutions, Q would be one, and that would be KEQ for this as well, because they're both the same, uh, the same half cell. So there's really no pushing force here. There's no need for the electrons to move anywhere. So the, the voltage would be zero. However, if we change one of our half cells, and, and look what we did over here to the left, we changed that half cell to a 0.01 molar solution, what would the EMF of that cell be? Well, in this case, it, it wouldn't be zero because we're going to have a difference in concentration here. So how do we figure out what the EMF is going to be, and, and how do I know that the electrons are going to, going to move here to create some voltage? Well, we have to notice that the cell is not at standard conditions. So standard conditions is when we have both half cells at one molar. Um, in this case, we clearly don't have that. So how is Q going to change? Remember, anytime we change concentration, we have to focus on Q. And we'll eventually calculate the voltage of a cell similar to this one, and you'll see how that comes into play. So since we changed one of our concentrations, Q is now messed up. Equilibrium is messed up. So what's going to happen? Well, the Schottley's principle is going to kick in, and it's going to help move the electrons in a certain direction. So we're going to see what that direction is and how that works in the next couple slides. What we have is an example of a concentration cell. So a concentration cell is when you have two half cells that have the same chemical reaction, but one of them has a um, higher or lower concentration than the other one. One of them has concentrations that are at non-standard conditions. So obviously the name comes from a difference in concentrations, where we get concentration cell from. Um, Here's an example of a nickel concentration cell. So we have a nickel um, solution over here that's one molar. If you remember um, a Beers Law Lab we did in, in, in Honors Chem or in Chem 1, nickel makes a really nice, um, cool looking green solution, a green color. Here on the left, we have a nickel solution, but it's very dilute. So it's 0.001 molar solution there. Um, so we hook up our salt bridge, we have our nickel metal in there. We're gonna get a flow of electrons here. Let's see how that works and what way those electrons are going to move. So here we go. Um, what's going to happen here is the cells are going to want to equalize concentration. So the cell over here on the left has a low concentration, right? 0.001 molar. And the cell here on the right has a concentration of one molar. So what do we want to do? We want to make the cell on the left increase its nickel concentration, right? We want that to go up. And we want the cell here on the right, we want that concentration of nickel to go down. So think about what you have to do here. It's pretty simple. You want to create nickel ions in the cell on the left. You want to get rid of the nickel ions on the right. You want to get those nickel ions to plate onto, onto nickel to make solid nickel there, which takes them out of solution. That would lower the concentration. And over here, we would raise the concentration by taking nickel solid and forming it into nickel two ions. So let's take a look at what our equations would look like there. So the cell on the left, I wanna take nickel and convert it into nickel two. That's gonna be um, where it loses two electrons. So that's my equation there, which you should write in. 
And the cell on the right, I'm doing the opposite, right? I'm taking the nickel two, adding two electrons, I'm gonna plate out solid nickel. Um, if you look at these two reactions, we can categorize those as oxidation or reduction. You can see here on the left, um, we have nickel yields nickel two plus two electrons. Well, what reaction is that going to be? Well, right, that's going to be an oxidation reaction, right? Oxidation is a loss of electrons. Uh, and over here, we have our reduction reaction, a gain of electrons. So since we know the reaction on the left is oxidation, what does that make this half cell? Well, right, it makes it the anode. Um, anode is where oxidation occurs. Cathode is where reduction occurs. Then what way are the electrons going to flow here? Well, electrons flow from the anode to the cathode. Right, so we're going to have some electrons going here, through here, and what we're going to do is get a voltage when that occurs. The important thing to look at here is what's our equation actually for this? This can get a little bit confusing. Um, we have nickel 2 yields nickel 2. Well, it's kind of weird, but we have two different half cells, right? Um, the nickel 2 on the left, the reactant side, well, where is that? Where is that from? Well, it's right here, okay? So that nickel two on the reactant side comes from our concentrated solution. The nickel two on the product side is here. It's coming from my dilute solution. So my equation is nickel two concentrated yields nickel two dilute. I didn't put the solid nickel in there because it's really the same on both sides, right? Um, I just tried to clean it up for you to give you this so you know what it looks like. This, this equation here is gonna come in handy in a few minutes. So we're going to calculate the voltage on the next slide of this half cell. You can see the uh, I labeled the anode and cathode here in the electron flow, so you should do the same in your notes. What will eventually happen is the concentrations will uh, become equal, 0.5 molar and 0.5 molar, and you would see that the voltage then becomes zero. So our cell would shut off and we would have any more um, electron flow once both concentrations become the same. Same as our first example, when it was one molar and one molar. There was no difference in concentration, so our E cell for that was just zero. So, uh, a voltaic cell is functional until E becomes zero, which I just showed you on the previous slide, and equilibrium has been reached. Um, what we want to do to figure out what our, our E cell is in a concentration cell, though, is, is using something called the Nernst equation. So we're going to derive that for you very quickly here. You may recognize this equation from our thermochemistry unit, thermodynamics unit. Uh, we have delta G at non-standard conditions, because there's no superscript zero here, equals delta G at standard plus RT ln Q. If you remember, Q means we're at non-standard conditions, right? We're not at equilibrium. Uh, what we can do is take delta G and delta G at standard, substitute in something from a previous lesson. So remember, delta G equals negative NFE. We did that a couple days ago. Um, so delta G at non-standard is negative NFE at non-standard. Delta G at standard is negative NFE at standard, plus RT ln Q. Next thing we're going to do is some math magic. Okay, we're going to rearrange all that, and you're going to get something that looks like this. This is our Nernst equation. You do not have to memorize that. This is the version that's on your AP formula sheet. What you can do is combine all the constants. You can combine T, if we assume we're at uh, 25 Celsius, R and Faraday's constant. Combine those three and you get 0.0592 over N and we change our natural log into a log base 10. So you may see this form of it um, occasionally, but just keep in mind on your AP formula sheet is this version of it here. So it's, it's your E cell at non-standard equals your E cell at standard minus RT over NF ln Q. So not that hard to use, you just gotta not make a calculator mistake, right? N is the number of moles of electrons, which we already know, because we've used that before. Um, something important to point out before we calculate anything. Nernst equation can be used to find the EMF of any cell. This is not just a concentration cell. I mean, you could use it to find the voltage of a concentration cell. That's what we're going to do. But you can really use it to find the, the, um, uh, the E cell for any cell at non-standard conditions, right? All you have to do is figure out what your E cell at standard conditions is going to be. Plug in the rest of your values here, you know, figure out what Q is, and you're on your way. All right, so that's an important point I wanted to make before we move on here. I'm just going to use the Nernst equation to find the, the E cell of this cell, but remember, it could be any cell at non-standard conditions. 
So um, here's my equation again up here at the top. Uh, my two half reactions are the same, right? So E, e cell at standard is zero. That was the, the first slide of the presentation today. When they were both one molar solutions, we said the voltage was zero. So for e, um, e cell at standard, plug in zero. I combine my constants to give it 0.0592 over n. I have two electrons in use here. And then my Q value, remember Q is equal to concentration of products over concentration of reactants. And that's why I gave you the equation again, because our product is our concentration of dilute nickel. Our reactant is the concentration of concentrated nickel. So plug them into your calculator, um, 0.001 molar over one molar. That's what our Q value is. Pop it all in, see what you get. Well, if you do it the right way, you should get positive 0.0888 volts. So it tells you that the electrons will flow. Um, obviously, you're not going to get a huge voltage here, but you're going to get something um, from that concentration cell. So you still do get some, some voltage from that. Another way to reorganize this, um, just so you, you guys can kind of see it here, if you take your, your Nernst equation, and at equilibrium, okay, so at equilibrium, E cell is zero, and Q is equal to K. It's when the cell, like, shuts off, right? Um, you can rearrange this and plug in zero for E, right? Um, plug in K for Q, because we're assuming we're at equilibrium here. Rearrange, do some more math magic, and you get a form of this where you can solve for K. You can actually solve for your equilibrium constant based on your E cell at standard, moles of electrons, and your constants all combined here. So just another like manipulation of this. Okay, to wrap up the first part of the lesson here, just a quick um, summary of all this stuff on concentration cells and the Nernst equation. Um, here's a, a simple voltaic cell right here, um, zinc and copper half cells. You can see that at standard conditions, Charts already done for you. At standard conditions, one molar and one molar. You can see that Q is equal to one, right? Because Q is, um, you know, where we're starting our cell here. It's going to be one because all of our concentrations are one. So you have no choice but for it to be one. Uh, you can calculate the E cell using your reduction potentials. You get a voltage of 1.10. You can calculate delta G and K. Remember from a previous lesson, K is humongous for voltaic cells, which is what this is. So it's 1.5 times 10 to the 37. Once the cell completes itself, like once the cell uh, reaches its, its expectancy, the end, um, your copper ion concentration here is going to be virtually zero. And your zinc concentration is going to be humongous, right? Because the cell goes to completion. So what's your Q going to be? Humongous, right? It's going to be equal to K. Your voltage will be zero. Your delta G will be zero. You're done. Look what happens though when you change concentrations. You can use the Nernst equation to figure out your new voltage, this column right here. So if I increase the concentration of my reactant, copper, or decrease the concentration of my zinc product, you can figure this out with Le Chatelier's principle as well. Look what happens to Q. Q becomes less than one. And from a previous lesson, when Q is less than one, on our number line that we had, right? We had zero, one, and you know a bajillion over here. When Q is less than one, the cell travels further. My mouse got hung up there. Travels further, right? And you'll you'll have a greater E cell, and that that makes that makes sense, right? Look, your E cell at non-standard here went from what it was on the previous slide, 1.10 to 1.13 and 1.16. Then if you do the opposite of what we did above here, if you increase the concentration of your zinc ion product or greatly decrease the concentration of your copper reactant, your copper ion reactant, Q becomes bigger, 10 and 100. So Q becomes some number here on the number line and the cell has less distance to travel. So your E cell becomes less than 1.1, which is what you guys see here. Okay, so um, you can figure this out with the Nernst equation uh, to get a, 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 a quantitative value, right? Or you can use Le Chatelier's principle and the, the discussion of Q to figure out if the E cell will be greater or less than your normal E cell at standard. So it depends on what the question is asking. If it wants a number, use the Nernst equation. Um, if it wants just greater or less than, you could save yourself some of that work and, uh, and not worry about it. 
Next thing we're going to do is take a look at um, corrosion of metals, which I think is really interesting, um, and that'll wrap up the lesson for today. All right. All right, guys, so we're talking about corrosion of metals because it really is just an electrochemical process that's occurring. So it ties directly into what we're you know, studying and talking about in this unit. So let's define what corrosion means first, and then we'll take it from there. Corrosion just refers to the degradation of a material, most, most likely metals, by a chemical reaction with its environment. So the most common form of corrosion uh, that, we, that we think of is rusting. Um, you know, the fancy word for rusting we, we learned before is oxidation. So um, some metal will undergo oxidation and it will form a metallic oxide. So we say that the, the name of rust, rust is just an iron oxide, right? That's the, the chemical formula for that. So how does, occur, how does corrosion actually occur? Um, in many metals, the oxide layer on top, like it doesn't work this way for rust because rust actually, that iron oxide weakens the structure. But um, sometimes you have that oxide layer on the outside and it actually protects the interior metal from further corrosion, which I think is really interesting. So an example here, you have an aluminum piece of metal and you have an aluminum oxide layer on the outside. That dense aluminum oxide layer actually protects the rest of the aluminum metal um, from more corrosion or from the, the outside um, you know, environment. Um, Statue of Liberty, another example here. So what it used to look like, okay, and so it looks like now, um, and there's that outer layer of corrosion over it. Um, another name for that is sometimes called a passivation layer, which I, I think is pretty interesting. So the corrosion of iron, what's really happening here? Well, it just is a matter of looking at the reduction potentials. So the reduction potential of iron, um, ion, is less than the reduction potential of O2. Um, so what would happen here? You know, so the O2 would be the reduction reaction, and then the the iron would be the, the oxidation reaction. So iron is being oxidized by the oxygen. Well, when the iron is being oxidized, it's losing electrons, which means it's going from Fe solid into Fe um, ion, right? So we're losing that solid iron and we're creating the iron solution here. Um, your reduction would be um, occurring at the cathode here with oxygen. Um, so dissolved oxygen in water usually causes the oxidation of iron. So you need to have the iron in some like humid or, or um, some, some environment where there's some water present. So the Fe plus 2 ion um, initially formed could be oxidized even further into an Fe plus 3. So remember, um, iron has a two oxidate, like two main oxidation states, iron 2 and iron 3. Um, we talked about that in, in Chem 1 a little bit. Um, it's really interesting how this works because the moisture, the water, acts like a salt bridge. So you have all these components of a voltaic cell within that rusting process, which I find really cool. Um, steel, which has iron in it, obviously, will not rust in dry air. It has to have some humidity in it. So cars last longer in the dry southwest versus the humid midwest. Um, and we'll talk more about some of the conditions as we as we progress here, but I think that's pretty interesting. So here's our example of, of iron corroding. You have your piece of iron here. You have a water or some moisture, you know, above it. So your anode, uh, which is going through the oxidation, is your iron. So you can see the Fe to Fe plus 2, and then it further oxidizes into Fe plus 3. Um, you're losing the electrons here, and that is going to the oxygen. So oxygen is gaining those electrons. Um, and that just completes our, our cell here. So your flow of electrons goes from the iron, um, you know, into the, the oxygen, and the rust deposits form on top of the iron. So you can see the corrosion occurring right here, this pit, and then it deposits on the uh, piece of iron itself. Um, the oxidation is going to occur at the site with the greatest concentration of oxygen, because you need that for it to occur. Um, and I said that the water acts like a salt bridge. So any extra dissolved ions you have in that salt bridge um, helps that, that process um, speed up. So you see the Titanic here, you know, what's left of it, um, and that's corroding um, and rusting very, very quickly. And that's because it's obviously in the bottom of the ocean, and the ocean has a lot of salt in it. So that's your salt bridge really you know, speeding up that process of that corrosion of, of all the steel on, on the Titanic itself. So that conductivity increases and the speed of corrosion increases because of that. So how can we prevent this from happening? So obviously you don't want 
um, you know, metal structures that are in, um, in, in human environments or even in water. Think of bridges, right? We don't want those to rust. We don't want those to corrode. So how can we prevent that? There's a couple ways to do that. Um, corrosion can be prevented by simply coating the iron with paint or another metal. So if you paint it, um, obviously you're covering up the iron itself and it doesn't allow the moisture to get to that, right? And for the oxidation to occur. Um, you can create an alloy, right? Stainless steel is an alloy of chromium and steel where there's enough chromium present to form a passivation layer, that protective outer layer um, of chromium oxide over the metal itself. So you can see um, like some stainless appliances, right? They're not going to rust or at least not very quickly, right? Because they have that protective coating over it. You can see some, um, some like drill uh, components here obviously have some protective coating over those as well to prevent those from rusting or corroding. So making an alloy with that passivation layer over the top or creating that, that um, oxide coating um, that'll slow down the oxidation is one way to prevent corrosion. Um, you may have heard of galvanized iron, galvanized steel. That's similar to what we just talked about on the previous slide. Um, but what metal is covering up the iron? It's zinc. So it's a protective zinc coating. So you maybe have seen um, some metal that looks like this. That's galvanized iron. So if you compare zinc and iron, look at the reduction potentials. Which one of these would most likely or would want to go through reduction? Well, it's the most positive value, right? The iron is the most positive value here. The zinc being not the most positive value would prefer to go through oxidation. So if you coat a piece of iron with zinc, well, look what happens. Zinc would prefer to be oxidized because iron would prefer to be reduced. So the zinc will oxidize, but it'll happen very slowly. Um, and that protects the iron because the iron's not being oxidized here. The iron is being reduced. Um, so that protects the iron, obviously, uh, that zinc coating does because of the difference in reduction potential. You can see that here. Um, if, it, if zinc covering your iron, okay, so this is your galvanized iron right here. If your water droplet, just like we had on the previous example with just pure iron, um, and you can see that because the reduction potentials are, are different here, um, you know, iron would rather be reduced, zinc would rather be oxidized from the previous slide. You can see the pit forming in the zinc anode here because that's going through oxidation. And then the iron cathode, um, nothing's happening to that, right? Um, because the oxidation is occurring here with the zinc protecting that iron on the inside. The next thing I think is really neat. I love the name. Okay, it's called a sacrificial anode. So this is another way to protect metal from corrosion. Um, there's a short video clip here from the TV show called Dirty Jobs, um, where the, the, the host goes, um, you know, in, in this location and, and looks at a sacrificial anode and what it does. It's a short little clip and then we'll wrap this up when it's all over. So I hope you enjoy this. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed that, that short clip there. To summarize that, if you have a, an underground pipe, um, whether it's a water pipe or carry some form of electrical wiring or whatever, um, you want to protect that, right? So if you have an iron pipe underground uh, or another type of metal that, that oxidizes very easily, you don't want that to oxidize. So um, you hook up a, a sacrificial anode to that, so that goes through the oxidation instead. So the iron water pipe um, you know, would normally rust and go through oxidation, but if you hook up some magnesium to that, look at the reduction potential difference here. Um, the reduction potential of iron is negative 0.44. Uh, magnesium is negative 2.37. So which metal would prefer to be reduced here? Well, again, it's iron because it's the more positive reduction potential. That means magnesium prefers to be oxidized. So that would be your anode. Magnesium would oxidize and corrode. The iron wouldn't. So what does this look like? Here's your um, water pipe or whatever uh, pipe you have underground where there's obviously um, a, a decent amount of moisture there that would that would cause corrosion to occur. Um, here's your magnesium anode, you know, some wiring that's hooked up um, and connected to that piece of iron. Um, and since that's connected now, what's going to go through oxidation? What's well, that magnesium anode? So this is going to corrode underground while the iron pipe does not. So again, like once this you know, fully corrodes or that, that anode is gone, you need to replace that like they did in that video clip that you guys watched. 
Um, but, you know, however long, like, they might last quite a while, right? Before you have to do that, you seem to make sure you're on, you're on top of something like that. I just think it's so cool that that's another way to prevent corrosion. And I just think, I, I love the name, a sacrificial anode. Like it says, it's, it's such a noble cause it's sacrificing itself for. I don't know. I think it's probably uh, a little cool. Okay. Um, that's it. So the homework is pages 37 through 39. That ties in what we talked about today with a couple, um, a couple other things as well. So you'll submit this the same way you have with your other homework assignments. You're going to go to Google Classroom. You'll find a document there and you'll just upload your work on that and turn it in. Same thing you did a couple lessons ago. Okay. We're nearing the end of the electrochem unit. There's only a couple lessons left. And um, that's really it for today. So if you guys enjoy this and found it interesting, and uh, I'll see you guys later.